I'm only going to talk about the first three of these missiles, four missiles there, uh, and then uh, you'll hear more from my cohorts, who I'd like to introduce. Uh, Roy Dreisbach is the one in the green shirt, and he was a He's a guy from the administrative side of the world when we started. And you know administrative folks come in two flavors. Those that feel that they have to police the force and those that facilitate the force, right? Well, Roy was one of the facilitators, saved my bacon on many an occasion. Next to him is uh, Cliff Kanzler, who uh, is one of the outstanding engineers. He's a life member of the IEEE. Uh, that I was uh, privileged to work with. Uh, I learned a lot from him. And the guy next to him, Charlie Bard, is also uh, a um, super engineer. Everybody at, in this panel has over 40 years with Lockheed. Now that in itself, think about that as folks from Silicon Valley. Uh, that's a very unusual family of people because most people, even in the aerospace industry, were itinerants and we moved around. Right? Okay, this organization chart is what the Navy set up in 1955 at the end of the year after President Eisenhower directed the Navy <coughs> to develop a system for launching missiles, actually, from surface ships is the way it started. And they were gonna use a Jupiter uh, Army missile, which was a humongous big thing, liquid propelled. Nobody in the United States Navy wanted any liquid propelled things on their ships, let alone on submarines. And by the way, they, the only way to figure, figure out to carry it was horizontal. And it, <coughs> the payload itself weighed 10% of what that A-1 missile ended up with. <clears throat> so, the organization that you see, and I won't go through it, but it, it basically the Navy chose to be the system manager <clears throat> and the prime contractor, and they hired prime contractors for each subsystem, which are shown up there. Lockheed was chosen. By the way, the selection process lasted approximately two weeks. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Admiral, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, hired uh, this fellow by the name of uh, William Rayburn to be the director. And he was an, an airplane guy, you know. He, he came out of View Air somewhere in the Navy. And uh, he was chosen because he had no, uh, no uh, skin in the game, so to speak. And you well know the problem typically in the government is there's a lot of competition between parts, of not only the services, but parts within the services. But who's going to get a given job to do? Uh, his solution was, uh, and he was given direction, I want to have the contractors on board within one month. And he set out to do that very quickly. Uh, what he did is he called the CEOs in from various companies and asked them to make a presentation on why they should get the job and why, what they were willing to commit in order to get it in the way of facilities and talent. Uh, as it turned out, uh, Lockheed uh, won the uh, job for being the prime contractor for the missile. Not the weapon system, but the missile. And that included everything about the missile except the guidance system, which MIT was selected, uh, the instrumentation lab later to become the Draper Laboratory, to be uh, the lead <coughs> organization with help from General Electric in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, the Ordnance Division, who was their industrial partner for this, and also the provider of the fire control system that was to go on the ships. Now the ships were uh, basically attack submarines of the skipjack class that were cut in half and a center section was uh, added with 16 tubes built by Westinghouse. And uh, 
the decision was made to build, to build a solid propelled missile about the day I arrived at Lockheed. And I saw some funny things while I was working on down in Van Nuys before I came to, to the Bay Area. But I got to tell you, some of them looked pretty weird, but they were various configurations of, of uh, ideas of how to build a, a solid propelled missile that would go 1,200 miles, actually trying to go 1,500, which was the original desire. Now, by the way, there's a big difference between 1,200 and 1,500 <coughs> miles of range if you look at a globe. <coughs> Excuse me. 1,200 miles, you have to go to the eastern part of the Mediterranean in order to target Moscow. You have to go very close to the Norwegian coast in order to target Moscow, which is kind of a standard for uh, you know a deterrent system. I figured you better aim for the capital and we'll be able to hit it at least. <laughs> so uh, that was a big deal. But in order to uh, and then by the way, the date was 1965. You know, like nine years after the start of the program. <coughs> The, uh, Lawrence Livermore came up with a lightweight uh, warhead design that we, we could tightly integrate into the reentry vehicle and actually get a one megaton warhead in a, a package that weighed about 800 pounds compared to a one megaton warhead of the older technology that was the Jupiter warhead that we were supposed to use which was 3,500 pounds. So you can see that there were some breakthroughs that allowed us to go to uh, what became the Polaris A1. <clears throat> and when those things came together, that allowed the system to proceed at a faster pace. The first, uh, there were lots of different kinds of test vehicles that we built in two years, over a two-year period, to test various parts of the, the uh, wild dream of how to make this work. Nobody had ever done it before. We didn't know how to do it either. <clears throat> but it was a strong learning curve. It was go out there, try it, and don't be afraid to fail. Failure was expected. By the way, in all fairness, we had a, pretty much a blank check uh, because of the priority. But if you think of those in terms of today where you can't get anything done inside of 15 years uh, in, in the defense business, it's uh, kind of frightening. Uh, I want to move on to show you the next slide, which basically shows a picture of the A1. And there's a four nozzle configuration on both first and second stage. And I was a, a mechanical engineer. I didn't know anything about electronics at the time. Uh, and I started at the back of the missile as a, you know, a slush pumper. I was in, responsible for some of the hydraulics to move the uh, control surfaces, which were, by the way, called jettivators. And they were really rings around the nozzle that could rotate around an axis and get into the stream of the exhaust. And occasionally they'd survive. You know, it, it, was, a, it was a major undertaking to make uh, those things work for 60 seconds. And we had a lot of failures uh, along the way. We became known as the Inter-Banana River Missile uh, in Florida. Because uh, the first missile went straight up. But, uh, by the way, the guidance folks at MIT, they didn't want to risk their precious guidance system flying on this giant pyrotechnic device until it was proven that it would work. So the first uh, 20 or so of uh, our, what we call the AX version of Polaris was, uh, they were uh, autopilot only with a pitch programmer, it turned out well. First flight, the programmer didn't start. The missile flew straight up, and somebody noticed, and they pushed the destruct button, and we set a lot of palmettos on fire. <laughs> <laughs> we went on to the next shot. By the way, we fired 
17 of these AX missiles. Very few of them succeeded in going the distance, uh, but we learned something on every one, and there were a lot of things to be learned about, uh, mainly about thermal problems on the back end of missiles. But there were other problems, like the second launch. Uh, the igniter blew out on launch on the first stage, went up and ignited the second stage, and uh, that flew somewhere over near a trailer park on the other <laughs> side of the <laughs> now, you, Can you imagine today? <laughs> okay, so that was the A1 Polaris. The next, the thing that I want to share with you is that as an individual, every day was a new learning experience. It was, it was fun. It was absolutely fun to work at Lockheed at that time. People were from all over. They would help each other. You know, there was none of this uh, I'm not going to share with you kind of stuff. It was, it was a team effort. And Roy will talk about how the team effort really worked with the Navy. It was a partnership with the Navy. It was not a we and them. And uh, that lasted for 60 years. By the way, 60 years we celebrated the birthday of uh, last October uh, of a program which now, in the far right of that family uh, portrait, the Trident II, is the most reliable system ever built for a, of a missile. <clears throat> which we're very proud of. I wish we knew exactly how we did that. <laughs> but uh, these guys can tell you more about that. I uh, learned uh, then that uh, we were going to have to do something different, which was the next slide, which was build a, a, a missile that would go 2,500 miles. And oh, by the way, that to do this, we eliminated one of the features that had been on the earlier missiles, which was thrust termination. This missile would light off, fly through the second stage flight, and at the proper velocity when it had been reached, it would eject the, the three warheads uh, with rocket motors, as shown here, hard eject. Remember, this is a... Uh, a deterrent weapon, not a first strike weapon, so that it was a city killer is what it was. So it would put a pattern out there of about five miles across between each RV. And, uh, and then the other thing, the feature about this one, it had instead of these awful uh, generator things, which were always a problem, we went to fluid injection on the second stage where he injected Freon into each of those motor nozzles to deflect them was sort of an interesting principle. Then, uh, well, that works pretty well, and we got to 2,500 miles range, which allowed much more operating area for the submarine. They still had to go depend on overseas bases. Overseas bases were uh, fundamentally uh, a dock where a tender could dock. And the tenders were basically factory ships that the submarines would come alongside of in order to, to uh, refit and uh, you know, replace spares and what have you. Uh, these were, if you go look at that globe again, uh, Holy Lock, Scotland, the very northern tip of Scotland, allowed us to minimize the travel before we were within range of uh, targets that were desired. And uh, another one in Rota, Spain, which was allowed the Mediterranean to be uh, covered without uh, much transit time. And lastly, one in, in Guam, which uh, really put the west coast, I mean, sorry, the east coast of the Soviet Union at risk. Next slide. 